My name is Marcia Bauman, and I am the Director of Clinical Education and Marketing for Stryker's Sage Business Unit. Stryker's happy to sponsor this session for Wounds Canada. This session is entitled Incontinence-Associated Dermatitis and Pressure Injuries and is being presented by our expert panel member, Joan Junkin. During this presentation, please put any questions that you may have that arise into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will be monitoring that throughout the session and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. We will leave time at the end of the session to dedicate to answering questions. Today, I'm very happy to introduce to you Joan Junkin. Joan, excuse me, Joan's transition into wound specialization came in 1992 when she was a research analyst for the United States-based Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research for the Pressure Ulcer Treatment Guideline Panel. I remember those as the purple booklets, and if I remember correctly, it was numbers 3 and 15. Yep. So that's as, about, as far as my memory will go. You may remember that as well. After becoming a clinical nurse specialist and board certifying wound ostomy and continence nurse, she spent 10 years building the skin and wound program at a 500 bed acute care facility. She continues to serve in a clinical role by sharing her knowledge throughout the wound care industry with courses and other symposiums, as well as publications in various journals and textbooks. She is also the developer of the IAD IT tool, which was published in 2012. Today, Joan has agreed to share some of her wisdom with us on the science and the evidence-based recommendations on skin hygiene and its impact to skin integrity. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Joan. Thank you, Joan. Thank you so much, Marcia, and thank you to Wounds Canada for inviting me to speak to your group. It's great. I love to come to Canada, and I've been there numerous times, and I love it, but um, this is a way that we get to share maybe with some people that wouldn't have been able to come otherwise. So I'm very pleased to be here. And by the way, here is Lincoln, Nebraska at the moment. That's where my home is. And uh, so that's, I'm talking to you from the middle of the US. All right, disclaimers. I am on the Speakers Bureau and a paid consultant for Stryker's Sage Business. And um, so in order to avoid a commercial bias today, I will not be using brand names since this is an educational forum. Well, let's talk a little bit about prevalence. Um, we always like to know kind of the state of the science. Where are we exactly? And where have we come from? Well, in 2007, I was privileged to be a part of a study um, my own hospital and Joan Selikoff on the East Coast in the US. And we found that 42% um, of our folks were incontinent. That was not unusual in those days. Um, and what we were shocked about, and I will say we were shocked, both of us, was that 20% of those people had damage from the incontinence, skin damage from the incontinence. The reason I say we were shocked is because we both were in charge of our skin programs at our hospital. Myself at a 500 bed hospital and Joan at a, Joan Selikoff at a teaching hospital. And we thought we were doing a great job. You know how that is. Well, you believe you're doing a great job, but still two out of every 10 patients had damage from their incontinence. So we had to, it spurred us to go back and look at some things and make some changes. Well, then just a few years later from Ontario, um, Heather Morrow and her, or, um, and she had some colleagues also that weren't on the, on the poster, but um, she's the wound care nurse at Headwaters Healthcare Center in Orangeville, Ontario. And she found in her facility that 33% were incontinent and of those, 39% had incontinence-associated dermatitis. So I thought about between 2007 and 2011, one of the things that happened was we were getting better at telling, we still have a ways to go, but we were beginning to get better at telling the difference between incontinence-associated dermatitis and those little second um, um, stage two pressure ulcers. 
that were on the buttock area. We used to call them all pressure ulcers, right? Well, now all of a sudden we were calling it incontinence dermatitis if it was, and so the numbers looked a little higher, I think is why that is. Well, then a couple years later, um, Dr. Gray and his, and his colleague published another one. 54% were incontinent. What happened in that time in history? Well, we were using less catheters, right? And so more people were incontinent. Makes sense. And still 23%, so almost a fourth of them that were incontinent had damage. Well, then in 2014, um, Kathy Fortunat and her colleagues in Alberta, Canada, now this was a long-term care facility, not acute care. And of course, so more were incontinent, we would expect that. It's one of the top reasons someone ends up in a facility instead of their own home. And of those 31% again had damage. So we're working so hard and I think we're making progress, but we have a ways to go, right? It's an uphill battle. All right. Well, what is the latest data that I could find? Um, it is from uh, the International Bed Survey that is done every year. And so it's international, but they separated out in this article I cited below, they separated out um, the Canadian and US data, combined data. And so in there, they did talk about the IED um, prevalence was 8.4% in long-term care and 19% in acute care. Now, that's probably not a surprise to anyone. For one thing, people are much more ill in acute care and there are factors such as Clostridium difficile diarrhea, and so many of them in acute care are there because of an infection and therefore are on antibiotics and more likely to have uncontrolled diarrhea. So I was not surprised to see those differences. All right, so 12% um, had damage, those that just had urinary incontinence alone, and that was the lowest percentage. But for people with fecal management systems for severe diarrhea, the, the incontinence associated dermatitis was 26%. Now there's no way to tell if they already had the damage when the device was placed, the indwelling catheter was placed for the fecal management. There's no way to, know, to pull that data out, but that's my guess. All right, so let's look at some of these risk factors that they found in this international survey data. Fecal management systems were a risk factor and that's not a surprise. So we just have to work you know, to get them healed up while they have the system in. Higher body weight, and I think that has a huge impact as far as the ability to do good hygiene. And so that's probably where that comes from. Diminished mobility, of course, and that was no doubt part of why lower Braden scales scores were also a factor. Additional linen layers were a factor. People with more linen layers, so like the pull sheet and the two pull sheets and then six under pads and you know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, they were at higher risk of incontinence associated dermatitis. So that's something to pay attention to in your facilities. Longer length of stay, that's no surprise because those folks were more ill and lower brain scale scores. And of course the mobility would be a factor, but certainly moisture would be a factor also. And I suspect nutrition, although they did not tease that part out of this particular one. So that's where we are. How can we do better? That, I guess that's the question for today, right? What, what are we gonna look at that perhaps we can make a difference when we get back, excuse me, um, when we get back to our facilities? 
Well, we need to keep skin dry, acidic, and protected. And I'm going to explain each of those because when we think of dry skin, don't we complain of dry skin every winter? And winter is, is soon to be here. Um, some of you may already have it. But dry skin, epidermis, the outer layers of skin need to be dry. They need to be dry, not hyper dry. In other words, xerosis or flaky and cracked. Not that dry. But they need to be dry as far as water is concerned. If they're hyperhydrated, we get into some serious problems and we'll talk specifically about that. Um, they need to be acidic. We don't often think about it, but our skin is has an acidic pH for a very important reason, and that is to protect us from outside invaders, live invaders in this case, not chemical invaders, bacteria, fungus, etc. They do not thrive in an acidic environment, which is great for us then, right? Because then we have less of the fungal rashes, the bacterial uh, skin infections and such. So it's important to keep it acidic and we'll talk about that. And then protected and specifically in this case, I mean from excess moisture, so we need a barrier and from excess friction. So we'll talk about how people are cleaned up that are incontinent and scrubbing, of course, and then from pressure, excess pressure or excess time in a certain position, which can cause a pressure injury. So we will speak about all those factors. And then consistency, you will hear me mention that several times throughout the seminar because consistency makes a huge difference and we can make it happen. I will talk about several ways, several improvements we can make. And then why don't we follow the research informed guidance from our expert organizations? So I will, I will tell those um, to you. So first of all, why is it such a big deal if skin is too moist? I mean, the epidermis needs to be dry, we said, why? What happens when it gets too moist or hyperhydrated? Well, it has decreased tensile strength. I always say to my patients, um, wet skin or hyperhydrated skin, it has about the tensile strength of paper towels. I mean, when they're wet, they are not as strong. No, even if you buy the strong brand, um, they just aren't when they're wet. They're not as strong. Well, skin is the same way. And so you end up with skin tears and fissures and such. Well, also it increases the friction coefficient. In other words, when skin is scraped across something, whether it's the bed or the chair or clothes or whatever it is, if it's too moist, it's likely to stick to whatever is moving against it and tear. Well, that would be an abrasion. Friction on skin on the surface is an abrasion, but it can also cause a deep tissue injury. In other words, if you're if your skin is too moist and it has stuck to the bed, but your think of this as your body and your skeleton slides down, the skin stayed in the same place, but the skeleton inside slides down. Well, that has kinked off the blood flow over the bony prominences. And that's where deep tissue injuries come. And they're very serious. So increased skin or friction coefficient is another hazard. And then the alkaline pH I mentioned, we need an acidic pH because an alkaline pH, it helps fungus and bacteria thrive. And so that's a serious problem for us. Well, here is a young lady who came in with Clostridium difficile related diarrhea. So it was pretty severe diarrhea, uncontrollable type diarrhea. And she had when she this is the day she was admitted and you can see that she has inflammation around her anus. You can see she has hemorrhoids also not unusual with diarrhea, right? But anyway, she has inflammation or red skin. And of course, she could tell us it was very painful. So this is IAD or incontinence associated dermatitis. Well, she also had, when we spread her buttocks apart to clean her up, 
we noticed she had intertriginous dermatitis, which means when skin is against skin and it sweats and moves together, so there's some friction involved. Remember I said when skin is wet, it has no tensile strength. It can't avoid tearing. Well, when, you know, when she moves and slides side to side in bed or parts her buttocks in order to clean, she got a skin tear. And this looks like it was, this was on admission. It looks like it was a few days old because the edges are kind of rolled. You can see the epiboli. So most likely um, this occurred at home. And this is a fissure related to ITD. This is not um, this is not a pressure ulcer. That's one of those that gets confused sometimes. And then we have, of course, the haz hazard of moisture or damage is you can also have an overriding fungal or bacterial infection. And so that is another problem if the skin has become alkaline. And how does the skin become alkaline? Well, simply being moist for a long period of time can do it. Moisture exposure, exposure for a long period of time can cause skin to become alkaline and be at risk for infections. Whereas, and another factor can be if you're using a soap, a regular soap to clean up, because that is usually alkaline. So that's where the incontinent cleansers come in. They are acidic. They're balanced to be skin pH, which is acidic. Okay, very important. All right, I mentioned consistency. Well, it is the key to success. Um, and that's what all the research shows. You know, you can read the IAD research and there are various skin protocols and they've had success, but they all agree no matter what they were using, that consistency is the essential element. And you know what happens. Sometimes you have a protocol, well, you always have a protocol for cleaning up incontinence in your facility or organization, right? Well, that's great. And then the weekend comes and somebody has their own idea of what's going to fix this person up and heal them up. They have this magic butt cream or their favorite whatever and well that's where we get into problems when we lack consistency so that's very important a great example of this was in on the sluicer um study and shelly sluicer was that nurse i mentioned earlier from sturgeon community hospital in, in alberta and she just happened to be doing trial on the all-in-one barrier clause and she was so she was doing daily pictures and this guy was telling her, oh my gosh, by day two, he felt so much better. And, and you can look at the poster, the picture looks, you can see that he is healing very quickly. Well, then she went home on Friday, came back on Monday and took a picture and he had severe IAD again. And he said, oh, it hurts so bad again. You know, I mean, the whole thing, it was like backsliding because they failed to use the all-in-one barrier clause over the weekend. They decided to do their own thing. And so um, that's a great example. If you have not seen that poster, I encourage you um, to get a copy of it. All right, so what do we have for prevention tools? What, what can we do? Keep skin clean and dry? Well, there are some, way, some things that can help us with that. We do want to avoid indwelling catheters whenever possible because of cauti or the catheter-associated urinary tract infection, right? but we can consider using non-invasive devices. Certainly um, for, for men, there are some options, the urinal um, it, for some of them, if the anatomy is right, um, is a possibility. For some, the male condom catheter might work, although I have to admit, I haven't seen a lot of success with that. And one of the dangers is um, nurses will say, well, we got a size smaller because we thought then maybe it would actually stay on, but that can cause erosion, which is of course a very serious thing. And I do have a, a study down below uh, cited about that. There are now available external female urinary collection devices. Now they did try 
I don't know if you guys ever use them in Canada, but uh, we trialed a few here in the States of um, a female urinal. Didn't work very well, never did work very well. But, um, but now we have an, an alternative and this particular one has some research with it, I cited below. And it has a very soft core contour and it contours between the labia and it's very, very absorptive. And then you connect it to suction and it won't, it won't cause any kind of suction to the skin because it's very porous. It's a porous core and yet it'll stay in place because there's a silicone pad, not adhesive, so it won't rip hairs out, but it's a silicone pad that secures it in place on the suprapubic area. Because it's connected to the wall suction, you now have an accurate INO, which is an excellent option. And um, people have had very good success with this. So that can be an option. Um, what other interventions do we have according to our literature, which we like to look at? Well, Dimitri Beekman, I cited below, he did a research or a review of the literature for us a few years ago. And he said, one of the things that we show in common is avoid occlusive containment products. And that would be like your plastic pads and briefs and such. Um, you don't want the all plastic kind. Uh, you want the airflow type under pad and you want briefs that have an airflow, at least a vented side for airflow. That's important. But also um, he noted that the all-in-one incontinence products Cleansing products do help promote compliance from staff, but more importantly, in my opinion, is it showed a decrease in the IAD rates and the severity of IAD. So successful, that's what we're looking for. And this is from Wounds Canada, our conference hosts. And this is from one of their documents, Best Practice Recommendations for the Prevention and Management of IAD. And they're saying non-rinse cleansers are ideal because they, redu they reduce the, um, the steps. So better compliance, right, involved in care. And they limit the risk of friction during skin care. We're going to talk more about that for sure. They are generally pH balanced, meaning acidic like the skin. So balanced to the skin's need, not a neutral not that kind of balance, but acidic, unlike alkaline soap. So they make that point. And then from their table three, it says gently cleanse, gently, and do not scrub or rub the skin and avoid friction. Speaking of friction, let's, and for those of you that don't do much bedside care, this might be a distressing photo for you because it looks very painful. At least to me, it does. And to her, it certainly was very painful. Yes, she has incontinence dermatitis. So she has inflammation related to her diarrhea, but now she also has a friction injury. So they were using a regular washcloth. In other words, the cloth washcloth with the little bumps on it. Sometimes they're called nubs. But anyway, what are those little bumps for? Why do we have bumps on those washcloths? you know it's for exfoliation, right? It's for removing layers of skin, which is great for our face because we wanna have fresh new skin. And for, oh, for instance, those folks who haven't been able to take care of their legs and they have chronic edema and they come in and they have layers and layers and layers of keratin on their legs. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Yes, we want friction in those cases but we don't want friction for someone who is incontinent and already high risk for the skin injuries. So friction then becomes an enemy instead of a friend. Well, we gotta have a sense of humor too. And I spend a good, time, a good amount of my time talking about the rear end, so I had to find a cartoon. Anyway, yes, so poor Don is new and he got stuck with the backside, but scrubbing, scrubbing is fine for a statue and it's fine for your kitchen floors, but it is a horrible idea 
for fragile or injured skin. And you know what? The people doing it at the bedside, they're not trying to be mean. They are not ever trying to be mean by scrubbing them to clean the person up again. It's just that they haven't been taught a better way, but we have a better way. And I'm hoping that everyone learns it before it's my butt in that bed getting scrubbed. That's what I'm hoping for. Okay. So I'm hoping everyone joins Scrubbers Anonymous because friction is great if you want to exfoliate skin, but we want to avoid friction in this case. So um, we don't want those cloth wash cloths. We want disposable cloths because they don't have exfoliating nubs. Much better option. In fact, the all-in-one barrier cloths are best according to, and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement is based in the US. Um, they are best because they are so soft. In other words, they don't cause friction and they leave a consistent breathable dimethicone barrier to protect the high risk skin. Here's the reference for that. And you can all get on the website. It doesn't matter, you know, where you are from in the world. If you speak English, you can use this website and they have some very nice toolkits on the, on it. And their pressure injury prevention toolkit says, provide pre-moistened disposable barrier wipes to help cleanse, moisturize, deodorize, and protect patients from IAD. Well, wait, it's on their pressure injury protocol. Well, sure it is because they're related, right? Which we're going to get to in a moment. So what are the best practice recommendations for critical care? Well, the NSWOCC has put one out for that in 2020, in fact, and it is for critical, critically ill patients, especially those suffering from COVID. They've made some very specific examples for that, but they include some very common sense wisdom, and it's to prevent moisture-associated skin damage, implement a structured skin care program. There's that consistency need again. And to prevent pressure injury, avoid use of alkaline soaps and cleansers for incontinence cleansing is what they're talking about. And use a barrier product to protect from excessive moisture. And that's where the dimethicone in the all-in-one products come in. All right, um, a little more of the science that we have. Pressure injury is much more likely with double incontinence, certainly, so fecal and urinary. And the rate of IED and healthcare acquired pressure injuries decreased when the all-in-one incontinence barrier cream cloths were used for cleanup. And so that is from Beekman and his colleagues and Karen Hall and her colleagues published those. So pressure injury. Now we're going to kind of shift a little bit um, because there is certainly a relationship between injured skin from incontinence and a pressure injury in that area of the body. So as you know, stage three and four pressure injuries are never events for hospitals. And um, that's from your Canadian Patient Safety Institute. And, you know, we have great beds. If you look at it, we, we have repositioning devices available at least. Um, we have underpads that are the airflow type now. We have some wonderful boots, but we also have to get back to Florence Nightingale's approach and that's where the basics really counted. You know, she wanted to keep people clean and dry and protected, although they did scrub people in those days, but, but, um, but research shows when we do that, we have not only a lower prevalence of IAD, but pressure injury. So if you're having a little trouble with administration or perhaps your value analysis committee, if you have one, if you're having trouble getting the tools that you need to take the right care, the best care of your patients or residents or clients, then I would suggest utilizing that powerful link between pressure injuries and incontinence dermatitis because people pay attention to pressure injuries. 
I'm sad that they don't pay attention as much attention to incontinence dermatitis, but it's a fact of life. So when I was trying to get new products into my facility, I always used the pressure injury angle because, and it's very clear in the research that they are related. They are associated. Well, here is here are some examples. Um, uh, Long-term care in this case, and this is that the one from Kathy Fortunat and her group um, from Toronto. It was pre presented in Toronto. Sorry, they're actually from Alberta, but it was presented in Toronto at the 20th annual, annual conference, and they saw a 70% reduction in IAD. Now, that is very impressive, right? And a 23.6 reduction in sacral pressure injuries. Well, and this is long-term care. It's a setting where resources sometimes are even more limited than in acute care. And they cite consistency as key. And they utilize the barrier cloths in order to allow staff to succeed in avoiding friction and it assured that the barrier, the dimethicone barrier, was applied with every episode of incontinence. So that's a nice, a nice study. Um, if you haven't seen that poster, I would look that up also. Um, another one is the Morrow study, and this was Heather. I mentioned this study earlier. She presented in a poster. Um, at the 17th annual wound care conference in Mississauga, Mississauga, Sagua, Saga. Sorry, not positive on that one. Ontario. All right. And, and her, anyway, her baseline IAD prevalence was 39%. But of those with IAD in acute care, this is 67% of them went on to develop a pressure injury. And after the 3% dimethicone cloths were implemented for incontinence cleanup, their IAD went to zero. So obviously they didn't have any pressure injuries related to IAD, that is, of course. Um, so this study is actually featured as a leading practice. It's still on the website, on, their, on the Health Standards Organization website. So you can look that one up. Nice study. Here's one from our colleagues in Australia. Um, and what they did was they implemented the all-in-one barrier clause for incontinence cleanup, and they found that they had a prevalence of 9% IAD, and they went down to 2, but they had a prevalence of 3.6% healthcare-associated pressure injury, and they went down to less than 0.1%. So, and it was a quasi-experimental study, so it was very well done. You can look that one up if, you, if you'd like, Ostomy and Wound Management Journal. So what are the important pressure injury prevention practices? Um, well, some of them sound just like the IAD practices, right? So keep skin clean, dry, and protected. That sounds familiar um, when you're preventing pressure injuries on the sacral area, right? So the all-in-one barrier cloths make a difference. Um, protect skin from over drying because flaking increases friction too. Interesting. Yes, moist skin has a higher friction coefficient, but so does excess, excessively dry skin. So heels, for instance, the heel ulcers are highly associated with extremely dry skin and that sort of thing. So um, just a little aside for you, I know we're talking mostly about incontinence, but um, dimethicone or oil works better than lotion for very dry areas on the body. For instance, those heels we talked about, but also the fragile arms. Some of those folks, you look at them, I swear I haven't touched them yet. I just looked at their arm and it got a skin tear. They're that fragile. You, you know who I'm talking about. All right, and any area with cirrhosis or flaking or cracking skin, dimethicone or oil is better because lotion is mostly water. Now, let me explain this because probably you're all thinking, but that's what we all use for dry skin. Yes, and for you and I, it works fine because we have sebum in our, we have still have skin oil, right? But 
Think about those folks with the dry cracked heels or the crepe paper arm skin. There is no sebum. There's no sebum there. And so you put the lotion on, the water soaks in, and then it evaporates because there's no oil to keep it in. And evaporation, we all learned in physics, is drying. So lotion actually is not helpful for what I call super dry skin, right? So just a, a little aside for you. And then overall, for preventing pressure injuries, of course, good health matters because our health is reflected in our skin health. And I think you probably all know that. Nutrition is important, of course. Hydration is important, of course it is. Um, exercise, and we have to get a little more creative with that with many of our folks, right? They're not gonna get up and jog or something, but even stretch bands make a difference and that sort of thing. They get the blood flowing again and, and get some endorphins going. And speaking of endorphins, there's great therapies for that, laughter therapy, pet therapy, music therapy, massage. I've spoken in a few provinces in Canada and I've asked them and, and they do, some of them have pet therapy and some of them have talked about music therapy. So that's really good. It's something to focus on. By the way, we need it too because <laughs> we need endorphins in healthcare. Do you suppose? All right. Well, then there's for pressure injury, there's also the repositioning aspect. And um, Dr. Nancy Bergstrom uh, is, is actually a colleague of mine. She was the head of that pressure ulcer guideline and they called them pressure ulcers in those days. The pressure ulcer guideline that I worked for. And so I was her employee for a year and it was fascinating, but um, she did a study later that on then, it was published in 2013, that showed, and now this, keep in mind, this is long-term care residents, and it was long-term care facilities in the US and Canada, and they were randomized to be turned every four hours, three hours, or two hours. Those turned every four hours did not get more pressure injuries than the group turned every two hours. Now remember, these were all high risk for pressure ulcers, yes, but they were stable stable high-risk people. So don't go back and say to your hospital, oh, everybody can be turned every four hours because if someone's not stable, that makes a big difference. In other words, there are lots of other reasons that we reposition people besides um, pressure injury prevention. So keep that in mind. But, but this, was, this was an amazing study. But the thing that she emphasized is it was so important to position people reliably. Now, I'm going to explain that because we all know pillows really don't work. So we've been in Mabel's room. I always use Mabel because I don't know a Mabel. But anyway, so we've been in Mabel's room and we've turned her because it's time to turn her. So we've gotten her turned and we stick the pillows back and we go back um, to do out to the next person and we're like, oh man, I left my best pen in that room. And if I don't go right back and get it, somebody's gonna put it in their pocket, right? Okay, so I go right back in there. It hasn't been five minutes, folks. And what do you think has happened? Yep, Mabel has wiggled herself right off those pillows and she's flat as she was the day she was born. At any rate, Pillows don't work. We, I mean, we all know it's true. So why do we still keep it as part of our protocol? I don't think we should. So here's one example. Um, or sorry, I'm uh, one example of a way to have reliable repositioning. In other words, you get them turned and most likely they are going to stay in position even the wiggly ones, and I've seen it, so I know it's true. Um, they can help reduce risk of injury to the staff. There are more shoulders, back, and neck injuries from repositioning in acute care, at least in the U.S., um, than there are more workman's comp claims for repositioning people than anything else in acute care in the U.S. And even obese people, you can turn them very easily with two people. And, and I've done it, so I know it's true. 
and it helps them, the wedges help maintain their position. And that is key. So it's easier on the staff, it's quicker. Well, let's look at some of the research. So some of the research shows that using pillows, 28%, and this was in an ICU setting, 28% of their people developed a stage two sacral happy or healthcare associated pressure injury. With, when they implemented the turn and position devices, zero, per, zero, none of them developed a sacral happy. And look at the time saved. It was 12.76 minutes per turn. That's per turn, not just per patient on a shift, but per turn per patient. Think of what you could do at that time. Oh man, you might get to go to the bathroom on your shift. It'd be novel, I know. Anyway, so that's important too, and time is money. So, so that speaks to why we need these tools and less injuries. Okay, so more evidence. There's gonna be a few of these because it's important. All right, um, compliance increases significantly. That's in this study. And correct positioning went from 34% to 69%. And most importantly, they had fewer pressure, in, pressure injury incidents. Very important. And so their labor costs related to repositioning decreased, of course, because of the time factor. And yes, a little bit more, this one was in ICU. When they looked at people turned with pillows, only 40% of them were turned even to 20 degrees. We're supposed to get to 30 degrees, according to the pressure ulcer experts. And yet we only made it to 20 degrees and that was only for 39% of people. That's not good enough. It's just not good enough. So one last thing, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about telling the difference between incontinence dermatitis and pressure injury. So one method is the location, shape, and color. So we'll look at a few pictures here in our last minutes together. And we'll see if we can see whether it was location, shape, or color that mattered. But when we talk about location, on many of our folks, we're not gonna be able to see the bony prominence on their backside. In the sacral area, you won't see the coccyx sticking out. You won't even see the sacral prominence in many people because they have padding, right? So you gotta get a feel too. So get a good look, yes, but also we need to use our best tools and that's our hands and palpate for the bony prominences. So let's take a look, oh, by the way, a new name for buttocks or the fleshy part, the rounded fleshy soft part of the backside is the fleshy prominence. Chris Berkey is a friend of mine from Lincoln and uh, she actually um, published that uh, case series and literature review. So okay. I found this on the now we can um, check it out. Um, now we can look at this poor uh, guy came in from home and he was having, he had diarrhea at home. And so um, unfortunately he was caring for himself and nobody told him about dimethicone clots. And so he did end up with some incontinence dermatitis. And what he told me happened here is when he, he was inflamed, he said, oh, Joan, my butt was on fire. And so he's weeping and he's weeping this serous sticky protein and it stuck to his shorts and he pulled his shorts down to go to the bathroom and stripped his skin right off. So that's actually how this happened. But if you didn't know the story, because half the time they come in and they can't tell you what happened, right? Well, then you would have to palpate, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, so I palpated the opposite side so he'd still be my friend, because that's kind of sore over there. And I looked at, could I move that skin anywhere near the coccyx? No, the coccyx is in the midline, it couldn't be. Or could I get it down to the ischial tuberosity, perhaps? No. It wasn't in any way over a bony prominence. Neither one of them were, they were a skin tear. They were, you could call them abrasion. You could call them a superficial skin loss. You could say denudement, 
but you can't call it a pressure injury, right? Okay, because it happened because of trauma, not pressure. And this one is simple. The color tells us. There's no way this was just from incontinence, right? So the deep tissue injury tells us that this is definitely a pressure injury. So some of, the, some of them are much easier than others, right? All right, here we have a stage four. Well, you can't get a full thickness wound on the backside from incontinence. So this is clearly a pressure injury in this case, not incontinence. <clears throat> this young lady had a stage one pressure injury over her sacral prominence. So at the top of the photo, you see it's a little red over the sacral prominence. I pressed my finger, it did not turn white, so it didn't blanch. So that's a stage one. And yet she had an abrasion, which is more of a traumatic wound or from friction, right? Over her fleshy prominence, as it's called now, her right buttock. All right, so location, shape, and color many times how, oh, speaking of shape, you don't see too many that are shaped like the tailbone. The coccyx is triangular and her pressure injury was triangular. She was so thin. She, I'm not gonna go into her history, but it's, it was a very sad case where she was not, she was anorexic. All right, so in this case, the red areas are incontinence dermatitis. It looks like maybe a little fungus too, but, but the areas up between the buttocks are, or on, a, on the fleshy prominence, in other words, those are not pressure injuries. Those are likely friction injuries, right? Okay, so location, shape and color. If you use those, I think it'll help, you know, if you teach your staff to use that. All right, this was an evolving sacral deep tissue injury. And um, deep tissue injury is the one kind of pressure injury, although they didn't include this in the definition, and I was really hoping they would, but it's not limited, it's not localized to a bony prominence because that skin, when the person slid down in the bed or chair, that skin was what hit the, the um, what, well, that's where the high pressure was that caused the deep tissue injury. All right, so in conclusion then, remember, we really need to work to keep skin clean but not scrubbed. And we have, we know about tools, the all-in-one claws to do that. They're very smooth and soft. We need to have them protected reliably. And um, what that means is consistency, right? We've got to look again at that consistency and they need to be dry. So we need to make sure that we're using the right kind of products to absorb. And then we need to reposition regularly and that might be different depending on your facility. If you're in acute care with unstable folks or long-term care perhaps can go a little longer, but it always has to be reliable positioning. And then we need to look and feel in order to classify buttock area skin injuries more accurately. And don't forget endorphins. And you know what? You need endorphins too because we need each of you to continue being dedicated to helping these very sick people keep intact skin. So I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all the work you do and thank you for attending this conference. I hope the information can help you in your practice and help your colleagues when you share it with them. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Joan. Very informative, very um, educational, even for those who think we know some of this. So thank you very much for covering that. We've had some great questions and a couple of comments. Um, the first question is coming from Sharifa, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. She's asking, is it possible for the skin or wound to be too acidic? For example, the overuse of vinegar soak on a wound. Also, how can you tell if a wound is more alkaline 
and how can you help restore balance? Would this only be moisture control? Okay, and that's a little bit beyond the scope of this one since this was about incontinence dermatitis and I was talking about keeping the skin acidic, but I understand what you're talking about with wounds they are also really looking at that um, because chronic wounds are always alkaline and so they're figuring that out that that's a problem um, and so um, i guess vinegar soaks now I've, I've not heard about vinegar soaks for i have for skin but i haven't for in a wound so i'm not familiar with that um, and I don't know if that would be recommended or not. I'm sorry, if you email me, my, my email was on the first slide. If you email me, I will look at that and get back to you on that one because I'm not familiar with using vinegar in a wound. Um, I mean, there are some other acidic products, but they're a balanced acidity. And so they would not cause any problems. And what was the second part of the- The second one was how can you tell if a wound is more alkaline and how do you restore balance? Okay, um, normally what they have you do is just start using one of the wound cleansers because they are acidic by, they are, that's how they are. Just like all the incontinence products are acidic, so are all of the wound cleansers. And so they usually just have you start using a wound cleanser rather than like soap and water or something like that, or just saline, which is isotonic and doesn't have an acidity. Um, so, so that's one way. There are some newer tests out, but again, that's beyond the scope of this uh, seminar. And I think one of the, correct me if I'm wrong, I think one of the key differentiators here is that if, it, if the skin is too much on one end of the spectrum, it's more prone for inflammatory conditions, correct? So whether it's alkaline or acidic, if well, it's too far on the spectrum, well, so you're back to talking about skin. She was talking about wounds. Um, but for skin, if it's acidic, then it protects us from fungal and bacterial rashes. Yes, okay. which, uh, which certainly cause inflammation, yes. Okay. So uh, Shriva, please capture Joan's email and send her a message and she can look into the vinegar for you. Well, uh, we Victor, can, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Never mind. Go ahead. Victor's just said great lecture. So thank you for that, Victor. We appreciate your recognition there. Elena asked, what product would you suggest for a completely retracted penis in a large scrotum? Well, um, I'm not allowed to discuss off-label uses of products. Um, and there is not a product out there that is made for that use. So I guess I'm, I'm kind of, um, if you want to email me also, I'm sorry to, <laughs> but if you want to email me, um, I could give you some ideas of what I've heard people trying. Okay. How's, how does that sound? That sounds good. Suzanne asks, uh, should we use barrier cream for healthy skin for incontinent patients as prevention? Yes, and there's no like hard and fast rule on that one, but usually what we, what we did in our protocol, I can tell you that, is if someone was incontinent three times a day or more, then we always used the all-in-one cloths. If it was less than that, it didn't seem like they were affected as far as their skin health. And so the more frequently incontinent folks is who we targeted and we always use them then for those folks. Okay, what about um, for Anne Marie? She says they don't have access to the pH balance no rinse cleansers. Is there a brand of affordable soap or cleanser for the home care setting? Oh, home care. Um, I can tell you that there are acidic soaps over the counter. Um, if you look in the dermatology literature, or if you email me, I know this is a broken record, but if you email me, I can send you a list just taken right from the dermatology literature that talks about over-the-counter acid, acidic soaps. Because for home care, sometimes that, that is needed. 
Here is another home care question. A lot of people being cared for in the home. Obviously, the soft disposable wipes that have the barrier product in them are available at the hospital, but where can they access them for home use? Oh, there are a lot of um, pharmacies. I know Walgreens and CVS, but I think, and, and I don't know all your pharmacies that have it available, but you can buy the incontinence cloths in the pharmacies. Yes, and, and Brittany, um, I don't know if they have access to e-commerce in Canada or not, if you're listening. Um, if so, can you please advise on that question? I know in the US we have access um, and also even Amazon um, sometimes carries right. the different products. So seen that. Mm -hmm. um, what type of oils can you use? Oh, good question. Um, I always tell people they're better off with a vegetable-based oil of any kind, wh whatever, coconut, um, olive, I don't care. I mean, if they want to use Crisco, I tell them, well, don't buy the butter flavor because you'll smell <laughs> funny. But, but anyway, it's, it's, an, it's a vegetable oil. They're always preferable because they not only are the oil that will help protect the skin and keep the moisture inside where it belongs, but also they have antioxidants and nutrients in them, whereas the animal oils do not and the mineral oils do not. So that's a preference. Okay, we have two minutes left. Um, would you, when would you consider using a petroleum-based skin barrier over a dimethicone base? Okay, if something is too dry, then certainly any kind of oil, in, including a petroleum-based, would be, would be okay. You can also use dimethicone on dry skin. But, um, but certainly, if moisture is, here's what I tell people, if moisture is the enemy, don't use oil because it's going to hold in moisture and prevent evaporation and cause even more hyperhydration. So you want to avoid oil when moisture is the issue, like it always is with incontinence. But for dryness, you can use oil. Make sense? Hopefully. Okay, I'm, going, I'm scrolling through. There's lots of kudos to you, Joan. Thank um, you. Also lots of recommendations on where to buy products in Canada. Okay, so you can chat with each other. Yes, Good. so I, I do have a couple of things um, to, to finish up with. Of, of course, thank you, Joan, for sharing all this knowledge with us and answering these questions. I'd like to remind everyone, uh, Joan will also be in the exhibit hall tomorrow uh, in the Stryker booth on the 16th. That's tomorrow from 1230 to 1 p.m. Eastern time uh, and can ad address any uh, questions that you have maybe some that we didn't get to tonight. So I apologize if we weren't able to get to your question, but please uh, visit her in the booth tomorrow and she'll be able to answer your questions then. Also, please remember that you'll get an evaluation link in the chat box. So please click on that link or copy and paste the link in your browser and take time to complete the session evaluation. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight. We appreciate your participation and really wonderful questions. And again, thank you, Joan. Thank you.